chat. So um, I just yeah. want to introduce Niall then. Niall <laughs> is um, laughing to him there. He says he's not a PhD, like the, like, like, uh, the, the rest of us were all PhD Niles. Um, but <laughs> Niall is uh, very interested in history. He's, um, um, he's a member of several um, historical societies, particularly in, um, in uh, Clontarf. He was telling me that he's, uh, he's emigrated out of Clontarf recently. He's moved uh, across the estuary to Dunabate. Um, but uh, he's still in um, uh, Clontarf, and I, that's how I heard of him uh, from uh, a couple of Anne Louise Mulhall in um, in Clontarf has heard Niall speak on Schoeninger. And I have to say about uh, Schoeninger, I heard this uh, this story about Schoeninger a couple of years ago when I was on, in Marion Square. I was um, on a tour. Somebody was giving a tour of Marion Square, and they said that house over there. Uh, they talked about Schoeninger um, and the the Institute of uh, Advanced Studies, and they told me the story of Schoeninger. And I, that knows everything, said. That never happened in Ireland. There's no way that that happened in Ireland. So when I got home and researched it, it actually did happen in Ireland. It's an amazing story. Uh, myself and I were laughing about it yesterday. So uh, and, uh, I leave you all to uh, to listen to Niall and the story about Erwin uh, Schrodinger. OK, Niall, go ahead. Well, there's a plaque on a house on 26 Kincora Road in Clontarf. It commemorates the simple fact that a man known as Erwin Schrodinger, a Nobel laureate, on a visit to Princeton University in the USA, was impressed by their Institute for Advanced Studies. A, 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 he had come here because the Taoiseach, Eamon de Valera, on a visit to Princeton University, was impressed by their institute, and Dev wasted no time. He wanted one for Dublin. Edmund Whitaker, a prominent mathematician at the University of Edinburgh, thought that such an institute as Dev had in mind should endeavor to get a prominent world scientist. He suggested that Schrodinger might be willing to leave Austria because of the Nazi takeover, and so it came to pass. The Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies was signed into law on 19 June 1940, and Professor Erwin Schrodinger was established as senior professor. Science is man's attempt to explain things. From the mid 19th century, the rate of scientific discovery gathered momentum with marvelous discoveries early in the 20th century. Schrodinger made his with his theory of wave mechanics in 1926. He was a brilliant, charming Austrian. He was one of the greatest scientists of the 1900s, a man with passionate interest in people and ideas. He was born to Rudolf and Georgie Schrodinger in 1887 in Vienna. They were a well-to-do family with a good background of science. It is written that as an only child, Erwin was looked after and doted on by his mother and his aunts, Rhoda and Minnie. He also had the services of young maids and nurses, all of whom considered Erwin to be a budding genius, deserving of constant adulation. And it is speculated that being raised in such a feminine atmosphere of loving care, that he expected and accepted the same in later life, and he got it. His father monitored his education, anxious not to push him too fast. He was fluent in English with help from his mother and aunts, and he easily passed the entrance for the gymnasium at 11. A gymnasium is the most academic type of secondary school in Germany and Austria. His gymnasium was the least religiously oriented of all those in Vienna. Erwin became indifferent, even inimical to organized religious beliefs and practices. His diary tells us that as early as his 18th year, he had read and studied Greek and ancient Indian philosophy. Erwin's best friend at school was Tony Orella, later professor of mathematics in Vienna. Erwin often spent holidays with the Rella family. Tonio had a sister called Lottie, with whom Erwin later said, 
I was fairly permanently in love. However, the sister of a friend would be inviolable and a relationship more intimate than an occasional kiss would only be the subject of dreams. Erwin was not yet prepared for marriage. Before Schrodinger entered the University of Vienna, many great scientists had worked there. The interpretation of the wavelength distribution of black radiation by Max Planck led directly to his quantum theory. Though much of his work done at the University of Vienna was experimental, Erwin was first and foremost a theoretical physicist and was influenced and taught by Friedrich Hassenorl. Erwin was also impressed by the work of Ludwig Boltzmann and he resolved to make mathematical physics his life's work and to follow the footsteps of some great uh, Austrian masters. Ludwig Boltzmann, described as the greatest theoretical physicist of all time, was revered by Schrodinger and his death in 1906 caused him much distress as he was just entering the university. Science was going through a most interesting phase with the gradual realization that Newton's laws that had served so well for more than 200 years had problems when dealing with the very small. However, the use of advances in statistical laws opened the door to the micro world and led to the development of quantum theory, an area of great interest to Schrodinger. Along with this great science, Erwin had his first mature love affair with a girl named Ella Colby. Sorry. Anyway. Uh, he visited the Rella family but made it clear to Lottie that marriage was not on the agenda. He got his PhD degree in 1910 equivalent to an honours degree in Ireland. After a year's military service, which improved his health, he went back to the University of, Duve of Vienna, where he was appointed to an assistantship in experimental physics in the department of Franz Exner. He felt dissatisfied with the university set up within Austria, though, where progress was often blocked. In due course, Erwin became a privat docent at his alma mater. They call it the first rung of the academic ladder. He nearly abandoned it by falling in love with Felicity, uh, the young daughter of his parents' friends. He was always captivated by girls who were just at the onset of womanhood. Her mother didn't approve of a match, but they wanted to get married and considered themselves to be informally engaged. Felicity was forced to break the informal engagement. Erwin was shattered. Since he was prevented by social pressures from a dedication of his spiritual, romantic, and sexual longings to the one person of his choice, he would henceforth look with disdain upon the institution of marriage and attempt to adjust his emotional life outside the norms of society. One theory, not a scientific one, was that he may have needed the excitement of tempestuous sexual adventures to inspire the ardent creativity that produced his great theoretical breakthroughs. Just before the Great War began was the peaceful period in which Schrodinger began his career as a theoretical physicist. He took no serious interest in the political situation of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. His physics, his intense reading of philosophy, the theater, and his love affairs left no time for politics. After Felicity, he fell in love again, this time with a girl named Irene Drexler. It was a romantic affair that was never to achieve fulfillment. The fact that when in his mid-20s, 
Erwin fell in love with three young women, but slept with none of them, suggests that Vienna maidens from good middle-class families did not then sleep around. He might have enjoyed other amorous pastimes without romantic complications, but that's speculation. Erwin served in the war without problems, but not surprisingly, he was disillusioned with the war. He used slack time to do some work and submitted papers. One on Brownian motion solved an unusual statistical problem. The significance of this, his first publication on statistics, was very relevant to his later research. It's a subject that lies at the heart of interpretations of quantum mechanics. In mid-1917, he wrote a paper that for the first time dealt with quantum theory. The Vienna School had a different approach to the Copenhagen School led by Niels Bohr. Papers on statistical dynamics uh, followed. He had become aware of Einstein's theory of general relativity during the war, and he recognized its importance. Three of his notebooks contain his intensive studies of the mathematical foundations of general relativity, work that played a leading role in his development of wave mechanics in 1925, published in 1926. Since, or still in 1917, Erwin got a visit from Anna Marie Bertel, a woman he met through a friend known as Annie. They must have pleased him. And in the autumn of the following year, they became lovers and also got engaged. She got a job in Vienna and once on a visit to the home of her wealthy employer, Fritz Bauer, Erwin met the 14-year-old daughter called Hansi, of whom more later. In the spring of 1920, Schrodinger and Annie were married. Annie became an excellent wife, relieving him of all everyday concerns, providing all kinds of food and wine that he preferred, nursing him when he was ill, and after his interest in her as a sexual partner disappeared, remained his friend and even helping him to find other feminine companionship. She knew he wanted a son. He took a post in Henna and then soon after in Stuttgart. The Ewalds, Paul and Ella, were their close friends in Stuttgart. Annie was greatly attracted to Paul and he became fond of his new admirer. Years later, they resumed their friendship when he was in Belfast and she was living with Erwin in Clontarf. Erwin studied a book called Atomic Structure and Spectral Lines. Despite being new to the subject, he quickly published a paper with an important contribution. During his career, he showed great skill in shifting from one area of physics to another and adding to each. Next was a reluctant move to Breslau in Germany. Uh, now Rocklaw in Poland. As Erwin had no political influence, he felt his career prospects would suffer if he turned down the offer. Luckily, he soon got an offer of a full professorship in Zurich. At 34, he had achieved a full professorship at an excellent university. Yet the truly outstanding piece of work that his abilities promised had not been realized. The next four years at Zurich were highly productive. There was a revolution in theoretical physics and he was part of it. There were many attempts to solve and explain the subatomic riddles. The quantum hypothesis. A young Harvard student called John Slater put forward an idea that radiation could be both wave and particle. At the end of 93, Niels Bohr, his assistant Henrik Kramers and Slater, they published a paper known as the BKS paper, extrapolating Slater's idea. 
Schrodinger was enthusiastic about new ideas put forward and followed up with a paper the following autumn. However, he didn't embrace all of the new hypothesis and together with Einstein's thermodynamical objections caused Niels Bohr to then doubt the BKS hypothesis. Henceforth, theoretical physicists would seek more radical answers. They were ready for a scientific revolution. In a book that Erwin wrote in 1925, he revealed himself as a man profoundly disturbed by the decline of Western civilization. It was a cry of spiritual pain of a soul torn between a need for religious belief and an inability to accept such belief without treason to his intellectual standards. Fortunately for him, he was able to keep his notions of philosophy separate from his physics, at least most of the time. At that time, his marriage was shaky, but divorce was ruled out. The principal factor was the romantic tendency of Erwin's character. He was convinced that bourgeois marriage, while essential for a comfortable life, is incompatible with romantic love. His diaries indicate that he was not a libertine for whom sexual contest, conquest was a name in itself. It was the falling in love that he valued most. Several of his greatest loves never led to sexual union, but the romantic passion was valued for its own sake. Innsbruck University recommended Schrodinger for the post of Professor of Theoretical Physics. However, the first of Schrodinger's six great papers had just appeared and he declined the offer. He was now about to be recognized as one of the world's most eminent theoretical physicists. The discovery that laid the foundation for Schrodinger's revolutionary papers on wave mechanics came from a PhD thesis by a young French physicist at the University of Paris called Louis de Broglie. Schrodinger's first paper went out on 27th of January 1926. Within it, he used the Hamilton Jacobi equation of classical mechanics. Sir William Rowan Hamilton was an Irish physicist, astronomer, and mathematician who made important contributions to classical mechanics, optics, and algebra. His discovery of quaternions also proved significant for the development of quantum mechanics. Schrodinger's paper, the first of six in that burst of tremendous creative activity, has been universally recognized as one of the greatest achievements of 20th century physics. Schrodinger's second paper was described as a masterpiece of scientific exposition. Planck said, about the first paper which he had read, like an eager child hearing the solution to a riddle that had plagued him for a long time. Einstein thought that the idea of your work springs from true genius. He later said, I'm convinced that you've made a decisive advance with your formulation of quantum condition, just as I am convinced that the Heisenberg-Born method is misleading. Heisenberg and Born uh, belonged to the Copenhagen School of Thought led by Niels Bohr. Then after he finished his third paper, Schrodinger's conviction of the primacy of wave motion as a source of physical reality began to waver. This was due to the lingering effect of the intense study he'd made in philosophy and Eastern mysticism. But fortunately, in 1925 and 26, he was creating new science at such an unbelievable pace that he had no time to consider the philosophic implications of his own creations. Just as well, I think. Paper four was the culmination of six months research activity that is without equal in the annals of science, both in the intensity of its creativity and in the importance of its results for subsequent progress in physics and chemistry. 
The results were achieved by one man working almost entirely alone. Nor was Schrodinger only doing physics. And he introduced 14-year-old twin schoolgirls, Ithi and Roswitha Younger, for lessons in mathematics. The lessons were successful, and it seems there was some cuddling and petting. Erwin Wood, Ithi, with poetry. The tutor fell in love with his pupil, but they didn't become lovers until years later. In 1927, after a visit to America, he went to Berlin as professor of theoretical physics and predicted to Annie, I have a feeling that we may not be staying there for so very long. In the University of Berlin, Schrodinger was in the company of an extraordinary group of renowned scientists who lectured in a range of subjects. His lectures were deemed the best, delivered in his beautifully expressive language. They've been described as always a pleasure and delight. But for Schrodinger, his great intellectual delight was the weekly colloquium that met weekly to discuss new discoveries and theories. Erwin enjoyed the theater in Berlin, as he had also in Zurich and Vienna. On visits away from Berlin, he frequently met Ithi Junger, described as his principal romantic heroine at that time. Later in 1929, he gave a lecture in Innsbruck, where he stayed with Arthur Marsh, who had married in July. Back in Berlin, he told Annie how much he was impressed with the beauty and charm of Hildegunde, Arthur's young wife. She was later to become part to become one of the great loves of Erwin's life. Schroeder and Einstein became good friends in Berlin. Both of them were averse to the social pretensions and they shared a dislike for the formality and stiffness of the Prussian professors. They spent many hours together walking in the woods and sailing on a lake. In 1931, an old friend of Annie's, Hansi Bauer, came to Berlin to study art. She was a raven-haired beauty, rich and talented, and quickly became part of the avant-garde scene. She was a frequent visitor to the Schrodinger household. When Ithi was 21 in 1932, she became pregnant. Erwin offered to take care of her child, but she had an abortion. His romantic thoughts were already shifting to Hilda March. I, I suspect that some members of my audience are having difficulty keeping track of Schrodinger's women. Under Nazi influence, the post-war recovery was declining. The times were hard for many people. Schrodinger made no secret of its dislike for the Nazis and their fascist allies, but he never sought in any way to oppose them actively or to join organizations dedicated to such opposition. Hitler, uh, Hitler was appointed Chancellor of Germany on the 30th of January, 1933. Most professors went along quietly with the changes, turning a blind eye to rampant fascism and persecution of Jews and minorities, as did Schrodinger. Einstein was exceptional in his openly favoring socialism and pacifism. In Oxford University, a certain professor of physics, Frederick Alexander Lindemann, was busy trying to arrange the rescue of eminent Jewish scientists from Germany. He was surprised when Erwin indicated that he was prepared to leave his prestigious position in Berlin and face the uncertainties of emigration to England. Schrodinger had been very naive, and though not Jewish, he had begun to see the Nazis for what they were. Lindemann promised to try to arrange a suitable position at Oxford. Schrodinger then calmly asked if a temporary fellowship could be obtained for his friend, Arthur March, an associate professor at Innsbruck, to be his assistant. Had that any connection with the fact that Erwin was in love with Arthur's wife, Hilda? 
Erwin had been ardently pursuing Hilda March for some months. Hilda spent most of the month of June in Berlin. He must have convinced her that he really loved and needed her, but she went back to Arthur. Annie and Erwin left Berlin quietly in the summer of 1933 and traveled to the Italian Tyrol, where there was a grouping of refugee scientists. Max Bourne and his family and the Marshes were also nearby. While Annie visited the Bournes with her lover, Peter Whale, an eminent mathematician, Erwin and Hilda went on a cycling tour where she became pregnant. Annie had long since given up objections to Erwin's love affairs and she had her own with Peter Whale. Conventional standards of sexual morality were irrelevant. Love and friendship were important and they could coexist in many permutations without engendering, without engendering overt jealousy. Some tensions inevitably occurred, but they were repressed. Still in the Tyrol, Hansi Bauer, now Hansi Bauerbaum, who was on her honeymoon, met Schrodinger once in the grocery shop and a spark of enlightenment arced between them, which was designed to kindle later into a more enduring flame. After the summer, Annie and Erwin went to Paris and Brussels for science conferences before arriving in Oxford in November 1933. They took up residence with the marches living not far away. At a welcome ceremony, news came that Schrodinger was to get the Nobel Prize. Congratulations poured in from all over the world. Having made such a mark in the world, it was no surprise that an offer came to visit Princeton to lecture for a few months. In March 1934, he went for a month and his lectures there were models of scientific exposition. He was offered a professorship position, but the pension wouldn't have been enough to sustain any. There was prohibition against alcohol and he was not enamored of the place. The system at Oxford didn't compare favorably with the German-Austrian system. Only one lecture a week was required, but the ones he gave were highly appreciated and were said to be the best physics lectures ever heard in Oxford. Erwin's first child was born to Hilda on May 30, 1934, and christened Ruth. George, uh, uh, sorry, christened Ruth Georgie Erica. Arthur March, Hilda's obliging husband was registered as the father. Before the birth of the baby, Erin and Hilda used to go everywhere together in Oxford, and he made no attempt to conceal their special relationship. He didn't regard her as a mistress, but rather as a second wife who happened also to be married to another man. Conventional sexual morality was simply not worth bothering about, so long as those directly concerned accepted the situation. Erwin loved and appreciated women, but his attitude towards them was essentially that of a male supremacist. Oxford society, on the other hand, was based on a sort of official misogyny. Wives were regarded as unfortunate female appendages. Erwin regarded society without women as detestable and barbaric. He complained, these colleges are academies of homosexuality, what queer types of men they produce. Still not too happy in the Oxford collegiate community and never concerned about pensions, a fellowship at an Oxford college and a grant hardly equaled the professorship at an important university which Erwin deserved. Following a visit to Spain in the summer of 1934, where his lectures given in Spanish were well received. He was offered a professorship at Madrid. The start of the Spanish Civil War put an end to that. While he was in Spain lecturing, Annie went to Switzerland to be with Peter Whale. It was not surprising that Erwin found it difficult to adapt to Oxford society. When Professor Lindemann 
discovered Erwin's liaison with Hilda March. He became furious. It was deplorable to have one wife in Oxford. To have two was unspeakable. Relations between the Prof and Schrodinger became strained. Lindemann was trying to get the grants for refugee scientists renewed beyond the two years originally promised. Finally, an agreement was reached to extend them through to 1936. However, Heart of March got no extension, so he, Hilda, and baby Ruth returned to Austria. Meanwhile, Franz Bohm and Hansi had been living in Berlin, but they came from a wealthy Jewish background and had managed to avoid the Nazi threat by going to live in London. Annie had obtained the use of a flat in London where she could, where she could go to get away from Erwin and leave him more time with Hilda. This suited Erwin, so we now had the freedom to be with Hansi, and surprise, surprise, Hansi became a frequent visitor to Oxford. In the summer of 1935, Hansi and Erwin went on holiday together to the Channel Islands. Schrodinger's research was during that time inspired by the cosmological theories of Arthur Eddington who virtually created the, the discipline of theoretical astrophysics. Schrodinger was enormously impressed by Eddington's ideas because they extended his wave mechanics to the ends of the universe and gave his wave equation a cosmic significance. An interesting aside, the astronomer royal, Frank Dyson, back in 1919, had organized two expeditions to test a prediction in Einstein's theory of general relativity, that light rays from stars would be defected, deflected slightly by the gravitational field of the sun as they passed close by. A total eclipse of the sun was necessary to check this, and there was one due on May 29. One team had gone to Brazil, and the other, led by Eddington, to Principe an island off the west coast of Africa. Two of the instruments used in that six successful expedition were celostats made by Grubb of Rathmines and lent by the Royal Irish Academy. Celostats were used to keep a mirror continuously aligned on the edge of the eclipse to reflect that image through a lens to make a photograph. In May 1935, a paper co-written by Einstein, Boris Podolsky, and Nathan Rosen was published. It questioned the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics. It became known as the EPR paper and became the subject of an ongoing debate that persists to the present time. Schrodinger, even though he was one of the pioneers of quantum mechanics, supported the EPR view, much to Einstein's delight. This battle of heavyweights raged on with Niels Bohr for the Copenhagen interpretation, making strenuous efforts to persuade Erwin to his way of thinking. There were also various paradoxes that questioned Copenhagen validity. Of these, the curious problem of Schrodinger's cat became the best known. Put simply, he imagined his fabled cat in a poison trap, which can be set off by some singular quantum event, like the entrance of just one electron or beta particle. Suppose, supposedly then, one must regard the cat as both alive and non-alive until its fate is inspected. In our minds, we can accommodate simultaneously the different possible outcomes. This superposition of states in our conscious realm mimics the superposition of particles properties in quantum mechanics. I suspect that Schrodinger had tongue in cheek when he came up with that mind game, for he must have realized that a cat in a box was way outside the micro world of quantum theory, but it certainly made Einstein happy. In 1936, he turned down an offer in Edinburgh and accepted one from the University of Graz in Austria. It included an honorary professorship at Vienna, 
and it's worth noting that the Austrian pension provided full salary after retirement. Hilda and his daughter Ruth were back in Austria and Hansi would soon be there, so the return home was promising. Despite what he already knew about the Nazis, who were prominent in Graz, he went anyway. Two years later, Schrodinger got a nasty surprise when he returned to Graz after a meeting in Berlin of the German Physical Society to celebrate Max Planck's 80th birthday. He had been summarily dismissed from his honorary professorship at the University of Vienna. This was probably because in his speech to a capacity audience in Vienna, he introduced an unmistakably political statement that was greeted with thunderous applause. The news of his dismissal was publicized and Dev picked it up. He quickly arranged a line of communication with the intention of inviting him to Dublin. Through circuitous routes, Dev got a message to and from the Schrodingers who agreed to come to Dublin where Aaron had agreed to work at the Institute for Advanced Studies. When Erwin, Annie, Hilda and baby Ruth arrived in Dublin on Friday 13th of October 1939, they were put up in the Caledonian Hotel in South Great Georgia Street and later at 45 Victoria Road, Clontarf. Before settling for 16 years at 26 Kincora Road, uh, also in Clontarf. Uh, his unusual family arrangements caused no problem there, unlike in Oxford. Erwin once remarked, in Germany, if a thing was not allowed, it was forbidden. In England, if a thing was not forbidden, it was allowed. In Austria and Ireland, whether it was allowed or forbidden, they did it if they wanted to. He had chosen Clontarf because it was near the sea, he was a familiar figure to local residents as he cycled about in all weathers. The professor of mathematics at Maynooth was Monsignor Patrick, or Paddy Brown, who became a close friend of Erwin. Paddy had a house at Dunquin on the extreme southwestern tip of the Dingle Peninsula in Kerry. Erwin and Annie were invited there for a visit. The three children of Paddy's sister, Margaret, were there at the time. Moira, who was 18, later Mrs. Connor Cruz O'Brien, Seamus 16, and Barbara 12. The Monsignor had practically raised the children as their father, Sean McEntee, spent so much time in revolutionary politics. Barbara was a beautiful child, and, and Erwin became infatuated with her. She was the third instance of his Lolita complex, along with Lottie Rilla, and Ethy Younger, perhaps it was the little boy aspect of his nature that attracted him to adolescent girls. Paddy had to speak to him, so he desisted from further attention to Barbara, although he listed her among the unrequited loves of his life. The Institute was formally set up in number 64 and 65 Marion Square South. An official in the accounts branch of the Department of Education responsible for paying the bills of the Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies told me a story. I recall him telling me that one day a staff member came up to him and said that Schrodinger had asked for a day bed in his office. Surely you're not going to approve that, he asked. Of course I will, was the reply. You see, that man is a thinker and he can lie on it and think great thoughts as he has done already before he came here. And that official, who also lived in Clontarf, was my father. Schrodinger was happy with his situation in Ireland, and despite wartime, the dais flourished, fulfilling the highest hopes of de Valera, and Dublin quickly became a world centre for theoretical physics. Schrodinger's gratitude to his new country was expressed in many ways, not least by the high level of service that he gave. Overall, he came across as a likable and warm person. Before the dais was fully operational, Schrodinger was giving lectures to undergraduates at UCD. His excellence at lecturing soon became famous. 
was when his first lecture was to consider two discomforting features in the plank board theory, it was clear indication that the ongoing feud between two lines of thought on quantum theory was alive and well. It was a tussle of titans, Einstein and Schrodinger on one hand, who strongly opposed the views principally identified with the Copenhagen School, associated mainly with Niels Bohr and Heisenberg. Keenly interested in the theatre since his youth, Erwin soon got to know many people in theatre and artistic circles in Dublin. The Bohemian set. Erwin met and liked David Green, a brilliant academic scholar who specialised in Celtic studies. Erwin was attracted not only to David's scholarship, but to his wife Sheila, an actress. A friend had said her good looks and charm caused the better half of Dublin to be in love with her. In July, the first major seminar was held at the Institute. Schrodinger gave a course of 10 lectures on perturbation theory and the mathematical background for the quantum theory of the meson. Newly arrived Walter Heitler gave 10 lectures on the meson theory of nuclear forces. Dublin had never before experienced such a deep and comprehensive treatment of an exciting topic in theoretical physics. In 1942, Miles Nicopoline wrote an article about a talk given by Schrodinger at the dais in which he mocked him. The first fruit of the Institute, therefore, has been an effort to show that there are two St. Patrick's and no God. The propagation of heresy and unbelief has nothing to do with polite learning. And unless we're careful, this institute of ours will make us the laughing stock of the world. Miles, Miles was back again when he commented on the remark given by an overseas guest speaker, Arthur Eddington, uh, that less than a thousand people can understand Einstein theory and less than a hundred can discuss it intelligently. He proposed to have it made compulsory in schools, to have it taught in Irish. Then, instead of being illiterate in two languages, Irish children could be illiterate in four dimensions. Both Schrodinger and Einstein spent much time on trying to find a unified field theory without success. Again and again, we see that Schrodinger was a man of many talents. Unlike many physicists, Erwin had a deep interest in biology, so much so that after 20 years, he was still a world authority on color vision. He had mastered nine ancient and modern languages in which he has written not only scientific texts, but also poems. Much of his work and his best work was achieved by applying his skills to improving and extending the work of others. He gave three lectures at Trinity College under the title, What is Life? The lectures were well attended and so popular that they were repeated. Erwin went on to publish these lectures, which introduced what was to become one of the most fundamental concepts in the new science of molecular biology. The chromosome is a message written in code. Cal and company were ready to publish when pressure from the church caused them to cancel. When the booklet was subsequently published by Cambridge University Press, so popular was it that in today's terminology, it went viral. It subsequently inspired many young physicists to turn to research in biology. What is life had a, had a determining influence on James Watson and Francis Crick. This is a case where a semi-popular book influenced research and future development of a great field of research. Schrodinger did not start it. He did not finish it, but his output in Dublin with this little book is still reverberating around the world. Mention 
was made earlier of David Green and his wife Sheila, who was a bright, feisty lady and a political activist. That's the book. Erwin and Sheila began to meet and in the spring of 1944, they became lovers. In this love, Erwin almost found the mystical union promised by the Hindu scriptures. In writing about this affair, Walter Moore says that unless he went to elaborate lengths to delude posterity, it's evident from his journals that Erwin was not a libertine. He speaks the authentic language of romantic love, seeking transcendence in the person of his beloved. Around the same time, Sheila became pregnant and Annie's visits to Paul Ewald in Belfast came to an end because of tensions. Erwin tried to comfort Annie and Sheila told her husband, David, that her affair with Erwin was over. He was great. He knew his wife had always wanted a child that he was unable or unwilling to give her. When they separated a few years later, David kept the child and raised her. David, who later joined the Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies, had a distinguished career as one of the foremost Celtic scholars of his generation. Sheila became a practical journalist, editing the newspaper of the Labour Party for a while. Erwin always loved statistics. He was good at it. And his lectures on statistical thermodynamics were published by Cambridge University Press. In less than 100 pages, he covered the fundamentals of the subject with an insight and clarity that has never been equaled. Soon afterwards, he published three papers on unified field theory. It may be that Erwin was convinced from previous experience that scientific creativity would be promoted and sustained by erotic excitement. But even if he didn't consciously decide to act on this principle, the fact that he had, had hardly ceased making love with Sheila May when he embarked on another amorous adventure. Kate, not her real name, a 26-year-old woman, the very opposite of Sheila in many respects. Schroeder was convinced that he and Kate adored each other. Just think of this. He brought her to Clontarf for tea. Annie, his wife, was most hospitable. Ruth, his daughter, was friendly. But Hilda, his mistress, was glum and withdrawn. It was a year before Kate gave in. So she wrote a poem about it. So he wrote a poem about it. Um, eventually, uh, eventually, she became pregnant. The baby, a girl christened Linda Mary, was taken to the Schrodinger home in Clontarf, where Annie and Lena, who worked in the household, devoted themselves to her care. Hilda and Ruth had returned to Innsbruck, where her husband lived. Erwin was delighted with his new daughter. The Americans dropped an atom bomb on Hiroshima. Schrodinger was dismayed. Unlike so many other great physicists of that time, he had never applied his mind to the development of weapons of mass destruction and was critical of those who did. He and Einstein were among the few theoretical physicists who were consistent in that regard. After the war, travel became easier. Visitors to the Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies led to lectures and discussion that in turn led to knowledge of still unpublished advances in Europe and America. Annie and Erwin had looked forward to renewing old friendships in England and the continent. In Cambridge again, Erwin was anxious to renew his love affair with Hansi Bauer. Leaving Annie in Cambridge, he met Hansi in London, where they had five days together. Over Easter 1947, Hansi came for a visit to Dublin. She met Kate, but wasn't impressed. She didn't meet Sheila May, which was maybe just as well. On 17th of February, 1948, the day before John Costler was elected Taoiseach in the new government, Ernie and Annie became citizens of Irish nationality. It was a fitting gesture of appreciation to the country that had offered him and his family a hospitable refuge 
during the worst of times. After lecturing in London on nature and the Greeks, Erwin returned to Dublin for Annie was suffering from a severe depression. She missed Ruth, whom she loved dearly. With Annie not well, the care of baby Linda became primarily the responsibility of Lena Lane. Kate was a regular visitor, but her relation with Erwin, her relations with Erwin were less than cordial. Kate's mother was afraid of scandal if her daughter were seen with the baby. So when one day Kate took the baby away from Lena, she left Ireland altogether. Erwin never saw his child again, but he contributed to her support. As a girl, she never heard her father mentioned until many years later when Ruth established contact with her half-sister. In 1950, his most important work was a 119-page book, Space, Time, Structure. He compressed all that he'd learned about the geometry of space-time and its affine and metric connections. It will remain one of the classics of science, even though Schrodinger and Einstein, as viewed from today's perspective, ultimately failed in their efforts to derive electromagnetism from the structure of space-time, or in other words, a unified field theory. At the suggestion of Arthur March, Hilda's husband, the University of Innsbruck invited Schrodinger to spend the winter term through to March 1951 as a visiting professor, and he gladly accepted. He was happy to go again to the place he loved most in the world. Not the least of his pleasures was reunion with Hilda and with his daughter Ruth, now a young lady of 16. Back in Dublin, and despite failing health, Schrodinger continued to work with the concentration and efficacy that would have done credit to a man of his, in his prime. From 1954 to 56, he published 14 papers and another of his short monographs, Expanding Universes. In 1955, the way was now clear for Schrodinger to return to a professorship in his native land. And so in 1956, he got a great send off and a magnificent welcome home in Vienna. Within two weeks, he gave his inaugural address and delivered one of his most polished lectures on the crisis of the atomic concept. He said that the materialistic picture of the world had been severely shaken and is today more uncertain than ever before. Wasn't he prophetic? He also said that modern physics was undergoing a revolution, the duration of which could not be foreseen. Back in Austria, he continued working and he and Annie were able to spend happy times in the Tyrol and his health gradually declined. And he died at home on January 3, 1961. I'll finish on a high note. John Gribben, the author who has just finished the text of a book on Schrodinger, one of my sources for this talk, went to meet a quantum physicist at Imperial College, London, to discuss the foundations of quantum physics. He was Terry Rudolph, who told him that he had grown up with no, without knowing that Erwin Schrodinger was his grandfather. His mother was Kate's daughter, Linda, who had gone to live in Zimbabwe. Terry's father was a chemist and teacher and influenced him to become a scientist. After getting an honours degree in Queensland, Australia, he planned a trip to Europe where he could meet his mother's half-sister, Ruth, who was now Ruth Braunheiser, Hilda's daughter. It was then that his mother told him who his grandfather was. Erwin had always wanted a son. Well done, Niall. You, you can take the rest of the day off. <laughs> that, that was very good. I, um, if, if everyone wants to unmute yourselves, if anyone has any questions.
Well done, it was brilliant. Thank you very much. So good. Yeah, well done. If I can answer the questions, do I get a PhD? Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't see anyone uh, querying Scholinger's theories yet, but you never know. <laughs> we, we might get somebody who'll ask an intelligent question. <laughs> I have to say, as Sonia here, I just got a little bit confused with all the women. I started to lose track. I, I really did. I don't know if anybody else felt that. Well, well, you might mention that I mentioned it halfway through the talk because I was equally confused. And I, I knew, that, I knew that my that. listeners would be. Yeah, no, it was beautifully portrayed. But myself, I was going back and forth with these women. So how he kept himself balanced, I don't know. <laughs> my, my theory is that he, he wasn't that good looking. So quantum physics must be absolutely a fascinating <laughs> subject. I'll have to learn it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what his attraction was. <laughs> nice, a nice voice, Geraldine. Sorry? Maybe a nice voice. And maybe that's what it was, yeah, yeah. He must have been very exotic in the Dublin of, uh, of the 19, the, or the late 1930s and 40s. You know, he was like, I suppose he was like a movie star, really, you know, and, and when we didn't have movie stars, but how we got away with it and how um, like people knew about it at the same time, the neighbours in Clontarf knew about it. Niall was telling me earlier that uh, he knew people in Dun in um, Clontarf that had remembered showing or living there. Wow. You know? Yeah. So uh, they, they, it was well, it was known in the in the um, in the area and it was known generally in, in the um, high society of Dublin what was going on. But um, it, it was just amazing like um, that he was able to get away with it when, when the rest of us were hmm. supposed to be dancing at the crossroads type of thing. You Absolutely. Know? And yeah. um, considering divorce was only brought into Ireland in 1996. So even if you measure it with that, you know. Yeah, it's, it's just incredible. Isn't it? But he'd be in a lot of trouble nowadays. Uh, Oh yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. So, some, somebody yeah. described him to me as a, a male as a male supremacist. You know, a supremacist. The way we have a white supremacist, he was a yes. male supremacist. Yes. Well, he was anyway, certainly brought up that way. I see. Niall, I see a couple of questions coming through. Maybe you'd be able to um to answer them. Um, Don is wondering where did the money come from? I'd love to know that. Where did the money in in Ireland in 1940s come from from to make a an, an, the dais? Well, De Valera was, was prime minister, or Taoiseach at the time. And uh, so there must be a certain amount of power goes with that. Because not only did he get the funding to, to launch the Institute for Advanced Studies, but when Schrodinger was, would be classified by Britain was at war with Germany, and Austria was associated with Germany. So uh, he couldn't get visas. To, to travel through England to get to Ireland. And de Valera facilitated that for the man with his wife and his mistress and his child to come. So de Valera, um, I think managed, and there was no, never in the, in the research did I come across any reference to the current archbishop. And I suspect that if he did ever get wind of it and say anything to Dev, that Dev would have told him to hands out, this is my, this, hands off, this is my area. And and it, so there wasn't a problem. Certainly not, there wasn't in Clontarf. Um, and the, um, the welcome for the Schrodinger's was through the Vatican. The what? Well, th that, that, that's an interesting story because um, a, the Vatican did a strange thing. They, uh, came up with this idea of, of honouring scientists. Mm. And I mean, Schrodinger was close to being an atheist and they, they gave him this honour. And because of that, it enabled him to use that facility to get messages uh, to Dev uh, because the exchange of communications uh, was difficult. But, they, but between them, they made it, they managed it. And his daughters would be in their 70s now. Well, Are they still well, alive? No. Uh, the, one of the, the, the things that happened to me since doing this talk in 2017 or 2019 uh, was that 
to celebrate 75 years of Schrodinger's book, What is Life?, which caused such an interest in molecular bi biology that uh, Trinity had, had one evening and then they booked the concert hall for two days for a world seminar with Nobel laureates and scientists from all over the world. And I, I was there on my own and not knowing anybody. I saw a, a man who looked to be on his own and uh, I went up to him and said, are you a visitor? And he said, yes, I'm from Germany. And when he found and read my, the booklet of the talk, uh, it turned out he was a fan of Schrodinger and an eminent scientist in his own right. And he told me things about Schrodinger and he, he said that there was a family in Austria that he knew where a woman there found in the attic a trunk that had belonged to Schrodinger. And he wondered if Schrodinger was having a love affair and had to make a hasty retreat or something. But what happened was the woman said that if he came to Austria, that he could have the trunk. And uh, this scientist collected the trunk and took it to Oslo and presented it to the museum, the, the Nobel Museum. Yeah, there's just a couple of other questions. Um, they said, um, Carol said in the Gaiety in 2012, there was um, a musical called Improbable Frequency. And that was about Schrodinger's um, life. There was a satire set in 1940s Dublin. I must look that up. I, know, I didn't know about that. And um, I don't know if you can do this now. Um, uh, somebody is asking about uh, the, your second last slide, you know, where you had um, the picture of, of Terry Rudolph. Yes. Can you, can you show that again? Or um, uh, I don't know what um, Hogan wants to know about it. Or is the date? Is it on it, Hogan? Um, oh, I see now. Um, I have to. <laughs> if, if, if it's too much trouble, it's not a problem. I really just wanted to catch the, the information that was on the slide. Well, if, if, if anybody uh, would um, Google, you know how you can get so many things on, on, on the internet. If you just Google um, Terry Rudolph, uh, there's loads of information and there's videos, there's YouTube videos of him and he's quite a scientist in his own right. That, that's brilliant. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. And then uh, another um, uh, message is saying, um, do you reckon that the, the, there was a lasting influence or impact on showing our stay in Dublin on, on our, our standing in the world of physics and science? Well, uh, the Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies is still alive and well, and uh, I'm not a scientist, and so I don't really know the, the I can't really answer to what, what yeah. the standing is, but um, Schrodinger, and, and that guy, I, you might remember, there was a scientist called uh, Heitler, who, who did great lectures on the meson, and he lived in, I found out afterwards, he lived in Seapark Road in Clontarf. Oh, there must be something in the air over there. Yeah, that sounds great. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. And then if anyone else has any questions or is that it? I must look up that, that musical now. I didn't know about that. I'll have to find out about that. Uh, yeah, I just caught it. It, was, it only played, I think it came out originally in... Um, 2004. I forget the author now, but I just, it sounded intriguing. And I caught a matinee, I think it was on the last day. And it was just unbelievable. Singing, dancing, puns, you name it, you know, really real live wire stuff. So right. hopefully, yeah. hopefully they'll have a new rendition of it. Yeah. And as for acceptance, remember that Michal and Hilton were well known in Dublin at all this time. And no one said nothing. Apart from Niall Montgomery, who just said that as a theatre critic, he divided his time between Sodom and Bigora, the gate and the abbey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and they say it was all Gay Burns' fault. <laughs> it wasn't quite. You know, if, if no one else has anything to say, there's loads of um, compliments. Um, Niall, I'll send them on to you. I'll send on the chat. And um, it was great to see everyone again. So if... if um, 
if that's all we have to talk about tonight, we can we can be, put uh, Erwin to, to bed. Well, thank you all. Yeah, thank, thanks thank very you. much, Ida. That was brilliant. Well done. Excellent. Good night, Thank good night, good night everybody. Bye-bye. Good night, Jared. Thanks, Thanks. 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 Thanks